Okay, folks. Sorry for the uh, uh, slight delay. Um, you know, uh, one of the most wonderful things when you have uh, presenters who are engineers and technical people is that they can make things work, and, um, uh, and as well as farmers. And uh, as we all know, farmers always find a way to make things work. So, um, right now we have the New York Energy and Climate Advocates uh, who are going to speak, and uh, they are Keith Shu and Dennis Higgins. Uh, Keith has a master's degree in engineering and worked in the private sector for 14 years in hardware design. Before moving to New York, he was employed with the Florida chapter of the Nature Conservancy on issues relating to the impacts of human development and infrastructure on ecosystems. He is engaged in New York energy policy since 2010 and currently volunteers as a technical advisor to organizations including the New York Energy and Climate Advocates and Nuclear New York and um, apparently now us. So as well. Um, he has provided technical input on the Federal Clean Power Plan, New York State Energy Plan, New York State Clean Energy Standard, industry regulations, legislation, and various projects. Dennis Higgins, the gentleman nearer to me, um, has graduate degrees in mathematics and computer science. Uh, he taught math and computer science at the universities of Scranton and St. Lawrence, and recently retired from the State University of New York system. Dennis, with his wife and four daughters, runs a farm raising beef, chickens, goats and vegetables. He has been involved in regional energy issues for over a decade, working with others to block hydrofracking in New York State and to stop approval of fossil fuel pipelines and power plants. I bring you the New York Environmental and uh, New York Energy and Climate Advocates and uh, Dennis. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks much, Steve. Uh, I'm Dennis Higgins, uh, and uh, Keith and I have worked quite a bit together uh, on a variety of issues, mostly energy-related issues in New York State. A lot of you people here are, are, are looking at things at a very granular level, uh, looking at the accelerated cycle plan, uh, station 94C, and, and, and there will be other speakers, I think, focusing on that. We're, we're going to take a mostly take a larger view, looking at the state's proposals. Um, so we're starting out with the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which was passed in 2019, um, and, and we're, we're going to try to investigate the question whether uh, New York can manage to save the climate without destroying communities, or save the planet, not save the planet, and still destroy communities. So it's a, a, a tricky question. So as I said, the, the, the New York State Climate Leadership Act passed in 2019, and uh, it has some uh, pretty ambitious goals. It, by 2040, we're supposed to have carbon-free, zero emission of electricity, uh, and uh, an interim goal of 70% electricity and renewables by 2030, which means installing a lot of something between the next, in the next eight years. 85% uh, reduction in state greenhouse gases by 2050. So, this is what the state looked like in energy production in 2019. Uh, you can see that we actually weren't in bad shape. Only 38% was generated by fossil fuels Nuclear was a full third of the state energy production, uh, and hydro was the, bulk of the rest of it. So, uh, 50, whatever, 50, 58 percent of the state's energy was actually carbon free in 2019. And uh, so, what's the picture going to look like? In, in the next eight years, the next eight years, we're supposed to be at, at 70 percent renewables and 30 percent of who knows what. And in 2040, 100% carbon-free grid. If you look at the circles, you can see that they're not the same size. With beneficial electrification, that's driving electric cars and uh, geothermal uh, systems, uh, air, air source or ground source heat pumps, um, and there are big pushes to, to do this. There are big subsidies for doing this. We're going to need a lot more energy in 2040 and in 2050 than we use today. So the, the problem isn't to generate the electricity that we need today. Problems to generate a lot more electricity than we do today. And there's a picture of it. So again, looking closely at the 2019 uh, energy picture, we have a, a, a fair segment, under 40% fossil fuel generated, um, but 58% was zero emission. Uh, and then we have to ask, what happened in the last two and a half years? One more. Yeah, I just want to point out that if you look at this picture. What you're seeing is the real workforces here, the things that actually provided uh, our carbon-free electricity. 
were two things. It was hydropower, large scale hydropower, and it was nuclear power. Um, keep that in mind as we talk about uh, things going forward. So, uh, some of the acronyms that you're probably already familiar with the grid operator is the New York ISO, independent system operator, and NYSERDA is the Energy Research and Development Authority in New York State. Both of those organizations have come up with analyses and proposals for how the state will get from here to where it's supposed to be in 2040 and, and uh, 2050. And you can see from this picture, especially the people that are involved in solar at, at one end or the other, the role that solar is supposed to play in, in, in that transition. Uh, we have no solar currently. There's 3% solar in the state, but somehow we're gonna get to this picture uh, in, in the next uh, 20 or 30 years. Um, and there are, there are chunks of, there's only one pumped storage facility in the state, that's the Glen Helen Hill Obama uh, storage facility down in uh, Um Battery storage is supposed to go from nothing to quite a lot. Uh, and uh, you can see there's a, there are chunks for onshore wind, uh, offshore wind, and, and so on. Yeah, yeah I, so um, I think a key thing to recognize here is you're seeing a massive ramp up, and yes, part of that massive ramp up is because we need more electricity, like we just said. However, the largest part of this ramp up that we're seeing is not because of that. The largest part of this ramp up is because we're, the state is proposing to use resources that are underperforming resources that don't actually produce a lot of electricity for how much you have to install. Um, there's something called capacity factor. That basically identifies how much electricity you can get from a source compared to what you could get from it if it could run all the time. So say you have a solar power panel out in space that's pointing at the sun all the time, but clouds in the way, it has a 100% capacity factor. Here on Earth, here in New York State, solar has a 14% capacity factor, which means a lot of times it's sitting there not doing it. So you need a lot more of it. You need a lot more of it to produce the same amount of annual energy over time. Same thing with wind. Um, conversely, hydropower, nuclear power, uh, these are base load generators that have very high capacity factors. So keep that in mind. What we're looking at is a proposal that uh, proposes to massively expand the wind and the solar to underperforming resources. Um, and the other piece of this is intermittency. With wind and solar, you don't have a reliable source of electricity, which is there necessarily when you need it. Um, Sun doesn't always shine when it doesn't blow. You've heard this before, and it's, you know, it's true. The consequence of that is you have to have storage to move that electricity from when you're actually getting it to when you actually need it. That's why you see a tremendous amount of battery storage associated with this. The other thing is that batteries aren't, you know, they're not a panacea. Um, they can be depleted over time. You still have to have some other backup source of electricity. That's what you're seeing in orange here dispatchable, carbon-free, firm electricity from some other backup source that's there when you don't have the sun, when you don't have the wind, when the batteries are depleted. And how much of that stuff do you need? Well, you see how, many, how much fossil fuels we have today. We basically have to have as much capacity in terms of backup generation um, as the fossil fuel capacity that we have today. So, What does this look like on the ground for the ocean? Uh, it, it relates to a lot, it's a lot of stuff we're talking about. Offshore wind, um, the CLCPA actually earmarks 9,000 megawatts, but according to my service studies, it's going to be more than that, we need almost twice that amount. For onshore wind, we're talking about basically somewhere upstate New York is going to have to uh, uh, make way for a large scale. Uh, um, wind turbine every three or four days. So every three or four days for the next 30 years, we have to install one of these things somewhere upstate. This is what I know you all are concerned a lot about right here, wind connected solar. Now, even if you, when you subtract off the back behind the meter solar, meaning the rooftop stuff and some of the smaller community solar projects, which is about 10,000 megawatts, after you do all that, my sort of saying we still need 50,000 megawatts of grid connected solar. This is the large industrial scale solar projects. When you do the math, how much, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of acres that have to be converted from whatever it is today 
you know, farmland or forest to glass, copper, and steel. Um, and that has to happen at a rate of basically 14 square miles of conversion every year for decades to come. That's an area larger than the whole city limits of Binghamton. Every single year. That would have to be converted from what it is today to, to silver. Um, I think you can start to see that there's a reality problem going on here. Um, this is actually the largest solar farm in, in New York at the moment. It's only 32 megawatts. This is what it looks like. Okay. So according to NYSERDA's analysis, we have to do 50 of these every single year for the next 30 years. Um, just to keep in perspective, remember I said 50,000 megawatts? Well, there's an interesting project. I don't know if this ever going to get built or not, but there's a proposal in Australia, in the outback in the desert, to build 10,000 megawatt facility, uh, basically 50 square miles. You can see this goes on almost as far as you can see. We would need eight times this in New York to do what my survey is proposing. Okay, that was wind and solar transmission. I don't have time to really get into a lot of details about how this works, but, but essentially if you're using resources that are only have a capacity factor of say, say you have five resources and you're trying to share them, each have a capacity factor of like 20%, so you need five times as much of it, all the wires have to still be there hooking those things up. So you need a lot more transmission than you have today. So one point is, uh, I guess the proposal, the local proposal, I think I heard was a 250 megawatt uh, facility, is that right? That's so, right. It's important to realize that at 14% capacity, you multiply that by 0.14, and so you only get, I don't know, 400 kilowatts out of it on average, um, which may not be more electricity than you need, but you're not going to get that electricity, that electricity is going down to New York City when the sun is shining, and when the sun isn't shining, all this transmission still has to be built, and it's going to carry something and it may not be wind power, and it may not be solar power, but it's going to be carrying energy from fossil fuels down to New York City. So they're not going to install uh, the clean path power, power line uh, through Marcy down to Queens to do nothing. It will carry solar and wind when there is solar and wind, and the rest of the time it will carry fossil fuels. Uh, yeah, yes, and, and um, you know, to round out the other pieces of the puzzle here, uh, in addition, and I sort of is saying that we need really lots of storage, like I said. How much storage we need? We need, well, this is the largest battery plant in the world, actually. It's in Ross Landing, in California. We would need about 100 of those. I'm sorry, I didn't get the slide right. We would need basically 100 of these things to be built to provide, to provide the storage capacity that's being suggested. Um, how about that backup generation that I said? It basically has to be the backup for all the equivalent for our fossil fuel capacity today. This is a picture, I know it's kind of hard to understand, I'll try to walk through it quickly. Um, but what you're seeing is an example of time in the winter, um, where you do have your, at the bottom here, you have your base load generators today, of hydro and nuclear. Um, and then you have the intermittent stuff, the wind and the solar. And in red, you're seeing battery storage. And it gets depleted. You can see it, it, you know, it, it can't carry you through the whole period. So you have these areas where you don't have wind, you don't have solar, and your batteries are gone. So you have these gray areas. That's a lot of capacity to make up for it. This is why it goes back to what I was saying. You need that much um, backup capacity in order to make the system work so the lights don't go out. So even if you don't have to run those backup generators very often, you still have to build all that stuff. So you have to start asking, does this, does this make sense from a system level standpoint? How are they planning on doing this backup generation? Well, the, the state has kind of taken the approach that anything that, that's not wind and solar is a false solution. So they've got to use wind and solar to do it. Um, and so what they're proposing is you have wind and solar to provide electricity, which would be run through that lot of trial sizers. Um, that basically is electricity that splits water into hydrogen and oxygen. That gives you the hydrogen that you then would have to store in a salt cavern somewhere far away. Um, and then you'd have to uh, bring it back out when you actually need the electricity, run it through fuel cells um, to give you the electricity that you need when you actually need, have when you actually need it. 
By the way, the round trip efficiency losses of this is like 50 percent. So however much energy you put into it, you only get half of it out by doing this. You should mention that none of that exists. And yeah, it's like this, this is the lab experiment currently. It, this doesn't exist. So right. right. This this is not something that uh, is, is, is happening at scale anywhere. Um, so how much of this do you need? Well, the picture I have here is from Hanwha, South Korea. There's one plant there, and it's actually not even being used for what we're talking about here. It's being used as part of the petrochemical process to make electricity from spare hydrogen on that. But anyway, we would need something equivalent to about 500 of these things would have to, would have to be built. And if you do the math over 30 years, you know, every four days or so, you've got to build a giant plant like that. Is this going to happen? Um, like I said, and why do you need all that much? Because you're trying to make up for all the dispatchable fossil fuel capacity that you have today. 25,000 megawatts. Um, and by the way, you know, you might think, oh, well, at least we're going to get rid of those god awful pipelines, right? That, that people can buy. Well, sorry, not really. Um, that service plan is calling for 400 miles of new hydrogen rate pipeline to support this, to go out to the salt canyons and back. Um, this is massive infrastructure for us. And of course, if the, hydrogen, if the hydrogen thing doesn't work out, we're not actually going to get rid of any of that fossil fuel. And so we'll still have all the fossil fuel and all the pipelines to do it. And we'll also have all the solar, too. So the picture will change drastically for upstate, for rural people. In upstate New York, your communities will be industrialized. Um, but those fossil fuel, nobody's talking about closing Ravenswood or, or, or Cricket Valley. Nobody's talking about closing any of those large uh, gas and oil power plants, they're, they're likely to still be here in 20 years. Yeah, that, that's basically our concern, is that this is a plan that's basically designed to fail. Uh, so, I don't know if you've heard of Rube Goldberg, Rube Goldberg he made cartoons of engineers who like to design things and basically taking a simple process and making it as complicated as you possibly can. This reminds us of, of that. Uh, and uh, there's a better way to Everything I said just now was an understatement of the impacts. I just want you to know that. Because uh, my service analysis involved a lot of wearing rose-colored glasses and making optimistic assumptions about many of the things I just said. Um, there's another entity called the New York Independent System Operator, NISO. That's the entity whose job is actually to keep the lights on here in the state. When they've done their analysis, They've actually shown that if we were to take such an approach, an approach that's predominantly wind and solar, we would actually need more of all that stuff we just talked about in the year 2040 than my service says in 2050. So we've got problems here, folks. Um, you know, some of the reasons that there's a big discrepancy is because my service is making mistakes. Um, I don't know how much time I have to go through all of these, but I'll touch on a couple of them. The first one is an obvious one. They're overestimating any capacity factor. The capacity factor of, of fixed panel solar here in New York is 14%. Like I said, they're assuming it's 20%. It's not 20%. In Southern California, it's 20% or 22%. Um, but it's not 22% here in New York. Um, they're ignoring issues of degradation and replacement. Um, if you build like a hydro plant or a nuclear plant, well, that's going to be there for decades. You know, 80, 80, 80 years is going to be plants good for it. Um, with, with uh, wind and solar, uh, you've got to replace that stuff in 20 years. So whatever the plan is for 2050, you've got to replace all of it before you get it. That hasn't been factored in. Um, there's real-time efficiency issues when we're deciding at least in the transition to back up the um, electricity from wind and solar with, with, with gas. What ends up happening is that you actually get into a situation where you're not running the most efficient gas plants or you're not running them as efficiently as you could. And you have situations where you have gas plants operating at hot standby, which means that they're burning fuel just waiting for the, for the case they're needed. So you can actually find yourself um, building a lot of wind solar and still burning about as much gas as you had before. Um, they're assuming availability of renewable imports. Um, this is something that ISO actually warns about. You know, if we build a lot of solar in, in our state, or a lot of wind in our state, and we're assuming that when we don't have it, the state next door has it, well, they don't necessarily have it. I mean, when the sun goes down almost about the same time over an hour of when it goes down in the state next to us. So, um, so that's not a valid assumption. Uh, there's also... Um, uh, and 
so a related point to that, uh, you may recall uh, California has experienced blackouts and brownouts, um, and part of that is that they expected energy imports from neighboring states that didn't happen. California is a decade ahead of us in building out solar and wind, so if you want a picture of where we'll be in 10 years, we'll be burning the same amount of gas and oil that we're burning today, we'll have a lot of solar and wind, and we may have blackouts and brownouts if neighbors don't have energy to give us. The, the line that they're going to put down the Hudson River um, from Quebec to bring hydropower Quebec is not, they're not obliged to send us power during polar vortices. If, if they need the power, they're going to keep the power. And that would, of course, be just when they need it down in New York City, too. So this is a very real problem, um, the expectation of being able to import energy when you need it, because your neighbors need it, too, at the same time. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. Um, uh, I, I would just... I'll just leave it at that and say that um, there, there are several issues that we've identified that are, are serious ones and are not nice to recognize them to, to, to. And then the last one, I think you all know, they're underestimating the opposition that they're going to get to the massive amount of energy squall that we're talking about. Um, so, I, you know, we, we can't fix all those things here on the screen, but um, I can give you one example. That very first one where the solar capacity factor if we were to fix that one problem, assuming we didn't get anything else wrong, even though we they did, um, if we fix that one problem, maybe not that much solar, but actually that much. So, you know, the, there, there's, there's definitely some mathematical issues here. So instead of that uh, big pretend that has to be coated, blended with uh, copper, glass, and steel um, every single year, um, you would have a carry the size of all of them that would have to be sacrificed for, for this type of uh, energy build out um, every single year. So what happens when you have a Pollyannish approach to energy like nice service? Uh, what are the consequences of that? Well, you fail. And that's the, the serious thing that we're really concerned about. What does failure look like? Well, how long here we come? I mean, this is a great concern, like my Dennis was saying uh, a moment ago. California has dumped lots and lots of money into building wind and solar, especially solar. Um, and, you know, that's good in the sense that they've, they've, they've provided some renewable capacity addition here. They've also shut down their nuclear plant plants so simultaneously with that. And if you look over time, for the last 20 years, yeah, fossil fuel use has gone up and down a little bit, but that's almost the same. It hasn't changed much in the last 20 years, despite all of this activity. And now they get blackouts. They don't have reliable electricity. And their electric rates are skyrocketing as well compared to the national average. Um, Germany is another very interesting example. Uh, Germany embarked upon a, an initiative called Ener Energy Venda, which uh, basically means in, in the energy transition. And they were committed to go uh, full steam with, with, with wind and solar and get rid of nuclear power. Well, what you're looking at here is a picture um, of the carbon intensity of different countries in Europe. Uh, the things that are brown have the largest carbon intensity of their uh, electricity system, um, the largest including carbon emitters. Um, the things that are green are the most carbon free. So where's Germany on this? There's Germany right there. Well, what happened? Okay, you can see they built out the capacity for wind and solar. That's the gray bars that have been built out quite a bit for wind and solar. Too bad it's not really operating much of the time. What they're actually doing is burning a lot of coal still and now natural gas. They shut down their nuclear and now they're brown. That's the result of uh, poor energy decisions. Let's look at their neighbor, France. France decarbonized this system actually a couple decades ago. Um, and how did they do it? Well, they did it with a, a, a reliable baseload source of carbon free energy, which is nuclear power. You don't even have to look all the way across the ocean in, in California to see failure, where you can see it right here in New York. In the last few years, I think we know that Indian Point, the nuclear power plant downstate, was, was decommissioned. Um, when that happened, nuclear power levels went down. In the state, fossil fuel, fossil fuel demand uh, went up for electricity generation. These are the consequences of, of poor decision making. And uh, I'm just going to step through these, but you can kind of see 
what has happened here? Does this look like we're going the right direction? 2020, 21, 22, this is where we are now. No, we're actually going backwards. And there are real life consequences to human beings when you do that. There were power plants that were built um, in the downstate region, Cricket Valley, which Dennis mentioned, and CPD, which were built specifically to make up for the electricity loss when the point was shut down. In addition to that, you have downstate uh, uh, fossil fuel power plants in the heart of the New York City metropolitan area, like Williamswood, um, that are having to run more because we shut down another carbon resource of energy and had, had to replace it with, with, with fossil fuels. There are children in environmental justice communities downstate that are now breathing more pollution because we did that. About 10 to 15 million tons of avoidable greenhouse gas emissions um, are now being generated that didn't have to be generated. So, uh, you know, we're talking about ending point, so let me just say, when, when the ending point was shut down, um, we lost the equivalent, um, we lost 83, we, one of the actors had 800 gigawatt hours of electricity, the other one was done 800 gigawatt hours. By shutting down just one of those reactors in the first year of, of the shutdown, um, we lost more annual carbon free electricity than all the wind turbines and solar panels that have ever, ever been built in New York State. So now let's ask ourselves, what would it take to replace any point, say, with solar? It would take 68,000 acres. And that's because you've got to take into account the capacity factor of solar is so low. Um, so when you think about that, you know, there were folks downstate that were pushing actively to close any point. You can thank them for the first 60,000 acres of solar you get up here. So a couple of issues that are sort of sidebars but that are involved in this. Um, uh, Ukraine was mentioned at the beginning when we were introduced. Um, Russia counted on U the European Union needing its gas when it invaded Ukraine. And Germany, which we just discussed, vetoed um, the full boycott of Russian gas. So you can see that energy, energy can be weaponized, right? People talk about, well, if you have a nuclear reactor, then you build nuclear bombs. That's not true. Germany never had any nuclear bombs. But they used a lot of uh, nuclear energy. Um, but we see in Europe that energy has been weaponized. Uh, Russia's counting on Europe, European need for gas. And France. France. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. France. <laughs> for France built out the... the, the... Well, and Germany, Germany, had, Germany, Germany had nuclear, nuclear power. power. Yes, yes. Uh, 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 so, you know, when you talk about nuclear... Weaponization of energy, you're asking, so who's going to profit and who's going to be punished in, in, in what happens? Um, there are big, mostly foreign uh, energy companies planning and, and proposing to build solar and wind uh, projects across New York State. A decade ago, or even less, most of those big proposals were rejected for environmental reasons. And this made those companies unhappy and it made Governor Cuomo unhappy. So Governor Cuomo in his last budget inserted a little thing called 94C. And um, the New York, I don't you don't have to listen to what I have to say about it, you can look at what the New York State Bar has to say about 94C. The burden of hosting renewable facilities, especially solar farms, will not be distributed evenly, but will be concentrated in those areas where it's easiest and least expensive for energy companies to build. They'll choose sites where the population density and prices are low. The ground is level, the soil contains no rocks or roots. These happen to be the very places where New York's prime agricultural, uh, agricultural soils are located. And, and that was also mentioned at the beginning of the, the, the discussion. Um, 94C, as well as the earlier uh, Article 10, robs communities of home rule rights. It shuts the mouths of citizens uh, and, and it, it neuters the seeker process, the, the State Environmental Quality Review. The siting laws um, uh, required the developer only to mitigate environmental harms to the extent possible on whatever land it proposes to build the facilities. Uh, it's important to realize no one's going to build solar, solar power plants, solar farms in parking lots at, at, at Walmart. They're not going to build it down the medians of the highways. They're, they're not going to build it in the state's brownfields. They're going to build solar farms and wind farms on our forests and on our farms. And you already know that. 
So, uh, yeah, as Dennis said, you have these compounding issues that, that are, are at stake here. Lots of problems, we've talked about them already. The logistical problems, the low, inherent low energy density of wind and solar, which just means you need a whole lot of it to make a relatively small amount of electricity. That translates to issues of land, material, supply chains, everything else that comes into actually uh, logistically building out the system. The technical problems of energy seed storage, the backup generation that I mentioned, the extensive transmission, the ecological impacts of the land impacts, uh, lost farmland, and then the political aspects that Dennis just mentioned. Uh, how are we going to solve this problem? You know, is there a better way? And we believe there is a better way. And that's what I would really like to talk about is solutions. Um, Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, so, uh, just very quickly, um, the two big issues, low energy density and intermittency, how do we address those things? Well, the good news is that here in New York, or in most places, most of our electricity is actually a demand that's there all the time. It's called baseload demand. So, if you have a source of energy that can run all the time, and it's relatively compact, then let's use that. That's the most effective system-wide Solution, optimal use of generation capacity. So yeah, we need firm capacity, but not just as backbone, but as the backbone of a system that can work. How do you do that? Well, we have hydropower system. We know we have that. I'm not worried about these things going away. We also have nuclear power. I am worried about these possibly, possibly using this. Fitzpatrick, Nine Mile Point, and hey, these are our workhouses, our workforces upstate. Um, to produce reliable carbon-free electricity for the last several decades. Um, they have relicensing requirements associated with them. Um, every 20 years, they have to be relicensed. In our view, if we're smart, we're going to relicense these things. If we're dumb, we're not. Um, and something I want to point out here is that in the state of New York, and I sort of, believe it or not, when you look at their scoping plan, buried in the back, in the scoping plan in the appendices, you will find that they are actually assuming that these plants are getting the license. So you can argue that's good. But what does it tell you? It tells you that even assuming these things are being licensed, that service says we need all that kind of stuff. Um, what that means is, yeah, we should be relicensing these, but we ought to be thinking about new nuclear health plants as well. Um, and there's some, there, there are a lot of advances and things I know in other group here is going to be talking about um, later today. But let me just briefly say as a what if scenario. What if, you know, in 20, the year 2035, when some of these uh, advanced reactor designs are coming to maturity, what if we started to build those here in New York? Well, you can end up with a system that you would be building more nuclear, but you could substantially reduce the amount of intermittent wind and solar that you have there. This is a much more realistic picture of how to solve our energy needs. And you wouldn't need as much backup generation either because you already have a reliable source. Um, you know, I don't want to say it's just about nuclear. There's opportunities for other hydro too. Uh, there's not as much opportunity because a lot of the hydro has been built out in the state already. But, um, but this is an example of one that I was actually trying to be involved with at one time to advocate for. Um, Green Island, it's up on the Hudson. Uh, they have a hydro uh, dam there right now that's generating electricity. There was a plan, a great plan, to actually revitalize this, increase the generation capacity of this, um, actually include, including uh, fish uh, exclusion uh, features that would actually make it better from an ecological standpoint. And this died, this project died. It died because it wasn't perceived as sexy, it wasn't wind and solar. Um, we need to be looking at the, the whole suite of solutions here. So we think that here's part of that, we think hydro is part of that. Ultimately, yeah, we do need some of this. We need solar, we do need some of this. We definitely need our hydro, but we also need nuclear power. It's the whole suite of solutions that we believe can get us to meeting our energy needs in a rational, reliable way. A credible climate plan that does not discriminate against viable carbon free sources. When you do that, when you pick sources of energy that have a low physical footprint, um, that have a high, uh, um, high energy density, and, uh, and our reliable, high capacity factor, you get to do this. You get to protect farmland, and you get to protect nature. You know, I'm, uh, I'm an engineer, but I came to support the type of things we're talking about here as an environmentalist. Um, this is why I'm talking to you, talking to you today.
And if we're succeeding in doing that, we get to give our kids a plan. So, thank you very much. Sounds great. So, do we have any questions for uh, Keith and Dennis? Sir. So the question was, for those who couldn't hear it, um, that in Scary County they voted down a uh, pipeline and uh, the questioner is asking how do we get around that in order to meet our energy needs. Fair enough? Yeah. Well, um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure exactly which pipeline talked about, about the Constitution pipeline. That well, some sort of pipeline. Yeah. 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 Projected, projected yeah, it was projected at a state level. Yeah, it was projected at a state level and, um, you know, you know, we're New York Energy and Climate Advocates, so we understand the need to get off of fossil fuels in a rational, rational sense of the way uh, and, and, and meet the growing needs of the energy of the, of the, of the world. You know, we need, we need to be looking at carbon free sources that are reliable. Um, uh, so ultimately, we do need to phase out gas, gas um, and like we phased out coal. Um, the question is, how do you get there? Um, so, you know, I. I you know, I was one of the people uh, that, that, that was working to try to defeat that project, that pipeline project, I'll be honest with you, um, because that would have intensified our use of, of, of fossil fuels. Um, but at the same time, I recognize that you can't just be, we can't have a ban plan. Uh, we need to have a plan that actually meets our energy needs, and that's why I'm here today to talk to you about alternatives. Other questions? Sir, yes. I thought that the Reverend told me you wrote a letter on that. Back over in the Bethany, we submitted that letter called Matt. Yes. Okay. The MJ back to the Catholic Factory Discovery. I'm glad you found that letter. Um, I hope everybody looks at it. We're still waiting for an answer. Yeah, no, yeah. We're still waiting for an answer to respond to, respond to that letter. We have sent it three times. We actually filed it. Could you guys really for everybody else to help with the letter answer? Oh, letter? Yes, yes. Um, there were a series of things. Yes, there, there were a series of questions uh, that we put forward to NYSERDA because of the flaws that we identified. And we pointed to the discrepancies with NYSO, like we talked about, um, including the capacity factor one that you just mentioned. Um, we haven't gotten a response yet. Um, and we've asked this question three times now. And we have filed it on the docket with the Clean Energy Standard proceeding, and we still haven't gotten an answer. We brought it up at public hearings. You guys should bring it up at public hearings too. We have chlorine powers, and we have alumen, and we still can't get an answer. But I'll, one, one thing, I'll, one, one of the things we do see said in the scoping plan buried in there is that they're assuming um, tilt uh, uh, tracking panels. Okay. First of all, the vast majority of, of, of these large-scale installations are not tracking panels, they're fixing panels. Um, plus, if you do tracking panels, single-axis tracking, you get about 1 or 2% improvement, so you get from like 14 to 16%, but you don't get to 22%. So they're still way off. So what is the tracking? What is the capacity factor? Something that they What's that? What's that? Capacity, factor. capacity factor of a southern state as compared to the uh, Southern California, it is about 22%. It, 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 no, no, but if you think, well, so they're, they're not particularly efficient, I think, is your point, right? Yeah, I, I mean, the best place for a solar panel was on a satellite where it's pointing at the sun that doesn't have anything that's left. <laughs> but, uh, the reason why I asked that is because I just had a meeting with a solar company, and they said, capacity factor, their installation is going to be 30 Costa Rica. It, yeah, it, they're, yeah, they're going to be some places near the equator, like the example I gave in Australia. That could actually be that high, but we're not going to live in those places. So the home rule, we can't local, local can't do anything to do. Home rule, home rule is completely unplugged by the 94C. We can't sue them for that. 
I'll get that back. Munic municipalities have and are in the process of suing the state over the seeker, the state, uh, the undermining the State Environmental Quality Review Act, and, and so far nobody has prevailed, but I think people have to keep hammering. Um, I think you have to keep bringing this to the state. Our lunchtime speaker, Ben Wisniewski, has uh, been a uh, part of uh, the, those uh, proceedings, and he will be talking about 94C and, and all that, so I, mean, I, I think he'll be very informative. What I've taken from your presentation so far is that our lawmakers are proposing this out of the old piece from what you're saying, this mix down the road, producing 70% of the energy Well, I and mean, if you look at the history of places that have tried, like California and Germany, they, they haven't succeeded in taking this approach. So, you know, we're trying to say, wake up, let's get real about what's the action. It is all people we have. We, we met with the governor's staff, and there was a serious non-wake up call. Um, I think one of the things, one of, our slideshow had a lot of numbers in it, and that's unfortunate. Um, the big, green, the big green organizations want you to believe that this is a simple problem. It could be solved with slogans, all renewable, all we work right now. And the governor has adopted those slogans too, which he talked about the Clean Path Project and the, uh, the, the, the Hudson um, Power Line. Unfortunately, this is not a simple problem. Um, and if you look for some really simple-minded solutions, you wind up with what the state has now. It's a complicated problem, but it can be solved if you approach it realistically with an engineering perspective instead of a slogan-based solution. And I'll just say that, you know, uh, I don't think hope is lost. I think we can make a difference, and um, that's why your voices are very important in this. We're still trying to prevail upon the powers that be in Albany on this issue. There are hearings that are going on. I guess that's what we talked about today. So there's an opportunity for us to, to talk about reality, because that's what we need. Yeah, everyone here has a voice. Everyone here can file comment. Um, one of the things we didn't talk about, but I hope uh, to be a later speaker will, is that there are no jobs in solar farms and wind farms. There are no jobs. The, the largest solar farm in the country is proposed in Texas, 80,000 acres, 12 jobs. A thousand union jobs were lost when they shut down Indian Point on 240 acres. So if you're looking for good, high paying jobs, you're not going to get them with wind farms or solar farms. The Catalogus, uh, the Catalogus County, the Alicat wind farm, uh, 30,000 acres, 13 jobs. I'm talking about the permanent job, not the installation job. So it's going to generate 13 jobs for 30,000 acres. So you can see we're not going to get jobs by building large wind farms or solar farms. So there'll be jobs during the installation phases, but I mean, it's probably a good thing they're calling these things wind farms and solar farms because it could be like migrant farming, uh, you know, people that are there just to come in to install it. So two and more questions. We'll, we'll take two more. Agriculture is our biggest industry in this county, dollar for dollar. We're replacing that with solar panels. Before that farm, that acreage was producing money to the tractor company, to the seed, Soil, so I mean, we're basically taking away from all uh, Another thing that, uh, you know, on Segal 2000, which is a group that I'm associated with too, has, has emphasized a lot, is that uh, working farmland is going to become more and more important uh, because climate change is already starting to happen. You know, places in California are drying up. They don't have the water that they once had. This, we may really need our prime farmland here in the future, not just for New York, but for the world. So I agree with you. Uh, this uh, lady and then Tim, and that, that will be it. I just want to thank you for your presentation and um, ask a question. Um, it seems like what you're proposing as a solution is to increase nuclear uh, to reduce the amount of solar and less the impact of land that gets converted. And it seems like a trade off. There, there's a, another group that's going to be talking all about that stuff, so I'm, I'm, I'm reluctant to get into too much of that. They're going to be on that. They're going to change the schedule. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Well, but what they did know is that all of the new commercial nuclear waste ever produced would occupy a, a football field 20 feet high. The, the, coal, the coal plants around the world produce that amount of waste every hour. So <clears throat> a serious waste issue. The uh, Harvard uh, came up with an estimate of 8 million people dying annually from uh, energy-related combustion emissions. 8 million people, that's 22,000 people per day, dying from 
causes related to combustion emissions. Um, and uh, nuclear doesn't do that. Nuclear generates none of that. So we're, we're, we're um, and they, uh, there's lots of little pieces of it. So the big, those big veins on the turbines, those are not being recycled. The, the panels are not being recycled. They're made by slave labor in China. So if you want to look at the, the big picture, you really have to look. You have to, you have to dig a little bit and decide what kind of solution do you want. Do you want slave labor in China to build panels that have to go into landfills in Texas? Is, is, that, is that our solution? Um, and, and they have to be replaced every 20 years. Um, so when people talk to you about levelized cost, the cost of solar per megawatt is cheaper than nuclear, well, that megawatt of solar produces 140 kilowatts on average, not a megawatt, and it has to be produced in 20 years, the nuclear gets, gets replaced in 80 years. So there, there's a lot of complicated factors. And again, I'm sorry, it's, the answer isn't a simple answer. It's a complicated answer. You have to dig a little bit, and it, it, it's not a slow, the answer's not a slow and then, uh, Tim, our last question. Uh, the inconsistencies of the level production of power from solar and wind, uh, they are claimed to, to be backed up by battery systems. What, what types of batteries and how big are these batteries that have to be in the area uh, to sustain the inconsistency? Well, I think I had a picture there that showed the largest battery in the world. Uh, it said Mossman in California, we would need about 100 of those. So it, it's a very large uh, commitment. Um, and it's depleted rapidly, which is why you still need all that backup generation from something else. So it, it's, you know, the most logical solution is, you know, if you have a source of energy that can run all the time reliably, let's use that instead of trying to have five times more of capacity uh, each underperforming and not getting the electricity when you need it. I think one, one kind of below the surface issue is you keep hearing about a brand new battery that's coming out, a brand new uh, hydrogen process that's coming out. Um, we're trying to propose, what we're suggesting is there are solutions available today that are scalable, that are, have been working for decades and decades, and we shouldn't rely on some new invention to save the planet um, or to save our economy. We should look at what we have currently. Um, so lithium ion is probably what's going to be used. We're not going to build any more pumped hydro in the state. That's well, I, want, I should say something about that. I mean, we looked at the map on that too, the, the pumped hydro. They have a plant in the Catskills that went on the Boa plant. Um, when you do the map on that, you have to basically build a dozen of those massive you know, reservoir systems to, to come up with the same amount of battery storage. So there's no easy answer here. You know, people, people seem to think that, you know, storage is the easy answer to, to intermittency. Storage is a harder problem than generation because you're not just producing electricity for a moment, you're having to hold on to it for a long period of time and keep all of it until you actually need it. So storage is actually a big issue. Great. And the disposal of that storage. What's that? The disposal of that storage. What's the lifetime of these batteries? Uh, lithium ion right now is only about 10 years. Is that right? I mean, they, 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 they're, you know, so that is a definite, definite, definite waste issue. You know, somebody mentioned issues of waste, you know, and people tend to think that wind is solar, okay, well, the wind is free, the sun is free, so it doesn't have any, it's not an extractive resource. It's actually a very extractive resource. And, and lithium mining is one of the dirtiest processes in Earth. You just have to look what's happening in Argentina and Chile. There's a shortage. <clears throat> okay, so I thank, thank you guys very much. So um, just a, as, I, as I mentioned just a, a moment ago, we're going to um, switch things around um, and have a